Hello, my tinklings. Welcome back. Be looking again at Polite Society, the Jane Austen board game. And today I'm going to go through and teach you how to play the game. I have read through all of the rules, and I did play through once by myself is a minimum two-player game, but um, I do like to adapt games to play them on your own, so we'll do that in a next video, just so we can see it played, but I just want to go through the rules and how to play in this So before we get straight into the rules, just a reminder that if you are at all interested in this game, it is available on Etsy. This is not a sponsored video at all, um, but I'd like to support our other artists if it is something that interests you. So, Polite Society. The main setup, we're going to go through how to set up your boards and all of that. Um, we don't have space to set up like a full table here, so I'm going to show you how we would set it up uh, for one person, and then I'll kind of point off where the other people would go if you were sitting. But first, we're just going to go through all of the items that we have and what you really need to set up a basic game. So, we obviously have our game box here. I've already taken everything out of the game box. We have our rule book, which I will consult from time to time. It's always good to have that for an easy reference, particularly when setting up your first we have our game boards, or our tables here, and we'll get into how to interpret and read those when we get to setting that up. Our two dice, our indisposed tokens, and then we have these four decks of cards. So we have our guest cards, our asset cards, which are actually all they're basically the currency in this game, so this will actually form a bank. But we'll set that up, so these will go face up. We have mission cards, so these are optional. We don't have to use these for every game. Um, but once you've played a few times, you may want to add on some missions for a bit of interest. And then you have your action so we'll get this set up. I'm just going to move our box out of the way. I probably will refer to our rule book from time to time just to make sure that we've got all our rules correct. And we won't worry about mission cards right now, uh, but I will go through those one at the end just to show you how you use the mission cards. So. This is basically what we'll need for our basic game. You have this. So your whole goal, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have eight places, and you can see this is styled to be a beautiful wood. And this is designed to simulate your dinner table. And so the idea is that you're going to be hosting a wonderful Regency party full of fashionable people. Hopefully, if you can get the right guests to your table. But worse than anything is having an empty table, so the actual goal of the game is to make it so that you have guests. Those are over in this guest pile, and that you have a guest at each of your eight places at your table. So we'll need one of those. Uh, you need 
need one for each person. Each person has their own individual table. So this is how you arrange the center of your table. You have your guest cards and you want to have space for four to be out at a time. We'll get into that in a little bit. Then we want a space for our action cards where you can pick an action card and then a discard pile. We also have a space for a discard of our guests. And then we have our asset cards. We have wealth, art, beauty, and wit. You can put these in any order, but I've put them in the order that they actually go on the card. So wealth, art, beauty, wit. So we have those set up, and then we have our indisposed tokens ready. So this is how you'd want to set up the center of the table with each of your players having their dining table ready for them. So you do need your game piece, but we're not going to worry about that for right now. I'll get into that a little later. I'm just going to show you how you actually set up the game. And then we'll get into how you actually take a turn. And for that, I'll shift things around so we can see everything all at once. But I wanted to show you, first of all, in setting up the board, the best way to set up the table so that everybody will be able to see and reach everything. It's just a nice looking setup. So to actually start the game, that's what we're going to get into right now. And I am going to set it up so that we can see all of our cards and the game piece at the same time. So, as I've said, the object of the game is to fill up your table. You want to make sure you're going to have a very stylish dinner party and empty spaces at the table would be very unsightly. So our goal is to fill up our table. Now, you will get two guests. To start, and after that, all of your guests have to be purchased. And so we can see on each character card, there is a cost. So Miss Isabella Thorpe from North Anchor Abbey, for example, costs three beauty and two wit. And if you are an Austinite, then the costs are a little extra fun detail just to uh, see how the makers of the game have interpreted the book in giving out these uh, costs. Now, for different characters, there's also a reward. So the reward for Miss Isabella Thorpe is one beauty card. So I'm just going to give you an example. So if we placed her on four, then any time that anybody rolls a four, you will get one beauty card. And so then that goes into your hand, and you can then use use that one beauty to give you on the way to purchasing Mr. Henry Tilney, for example. We'll get into how your turn goes and all of that, but that's the basic idea. You get rewards from uh, the different characters that you have around your table, and also your action cards, which we'll get into. But you kind of want to understand that when you're setting up for the first time, so that you know where you might want to place your characters, I guess, as we say. The characters do not all have, so you have characters that have rewards, and you can see that they vary. It can be one, two, three different cards you may get per character, and generally the more main character or more liked character, you might get more. Um... But there are some, so you can see Kitty Bennett, who give you no reward, but she still is a guest who you can set at your table. 
and there is the occasional Can we find one? There aren't many, but there are the occasional uh, care guests who give you a negative reward They are not advantageous to have not what we're dealing with here. So, to start off with, to get everyone set up so that they have their first two guests, what you'll need to determine is how many players you have playing, and then multiply that by two. So, for example, here, we would be perfectly set up to have a two-player game. And so then you roll to see who has the highest number, and the person with the highest number gets to choose their character first. So here we'd probably either choose Miss Bennett or Mr. Tilney. And it more depends on, I guess, which particular rewards you most feel like. So we'll just take ben Miss Bennett because, you know, Pride and Prejudice, even though I do love Mr. Tilney. So if we put her, part of your strategy, not to go too much into that, but obviously the more rewards you're getting, the better numbers you want to put. So six and eight are your best numbers, then five and nine, then four and ten, two and three being your worst numbers. So if you have a negative or no reward, 2 and 3 or 11 and 12 are going to be probably your best spots. So then our second player would probably take Dilney, and then the person who goes second gets next choice. So I would probably choose Mrs. Jennings, and then we would get Isabella Thorpe, and we might put her at So that's how you get set up on your board. You just decide that. And basically, after that, we'll get into how you take each turn. So there are two phases to each turn. The guest phase and the action phase. The guest phase is quick at the beginning. But we do need to, at the beginning of each turn, make sure that we have four guests that are up and available for purchase. So we will have to put out four. But at the beginning of each turn, you want to make sure that there are four guests. And that completes the guest phase. Then you move to the action phase. And there are three phases there. First, you'll roll, so we might get a seven, and that's actually quite relevant because there are two things that can happen. You basically either get a seven or not a seven. When you roll the dice, if you get a seven, then all of these characters our guests are then put into the discard pile. And then you will get four new guests. Now in the action cards there are some table improvements that give you a basically a reward for a seven, so then you would pick those up as well. So that is the first phase you roll. The other thing is, so if you roll a six, let's say, then you pick up the rewards that correspond to that number on your dining table. So if we rolled Six instead, then we would take two beauty and one heart, because 
also the farm is Jane Bennett and those go into your hand. And that happens no matter who rolls the number. Now obviously it'd be more ideal to have a little more space here so we can see that Miss Caroline Bingley is not our two or three, but won't worry about that right now. But just uh, keep that in mind. Now, the next thing that you do after having rolled and taken all of those things, we move into the action phase. So you take two action cards, and there are a number of different cards. We'll go through the action cards in more detail, but for right now, I'm just going to go through a turn, and then we'll go through the action cards in more detail. The active player, so me, whose turn it is, you choose one of these action cards and you discard the other. So we'll just say we won't remove the guest. So rearrange guests. On the action card, you can basically just do what it says on the card. Rearrange any number of guests at your table to the seat allocations of your choice. So let's say that I had put Jane at 4, and I'm like, oh no, we're going to put her at 8. I could do that, and I might decide, oh, Isabella Thorpe, I'm happy to have her where she is, we'll just leave her. So that's that phase. So you have your action phase. Any time during your action phase, you can also do any of the following actions. You can purchase any of these guests, so you can do that before or after you do your action card, like actually fulfill the action card. It's completely up to the active player in what order those things are done. So we have one to two beauty and one heart. Uh, we don't have any characters, guests, that can be bought at that price. So we wouldn't be able to purchase anyone, but that if we did have the cost, then we could purchase a character, a guest. <laughs> um, you can also trade asset cards with any uh, other car other player. So if we don't have enough cards, but let's say we wanted to say, oh, I'll give you two beauty for one wealth. Since we don't have any wealth, then those sorts of trades could be done. There does have to be at least one card traded on each side. And then you can also, if you can't find a willing trader of players around the table, then you can trade four of one asset card in with the bank for any of the other asset cards. So obviously the main point of everything is to then go through that, complete your actions, and then it's the next person's turn, and they'll go through their phases, refresh, make sure all the guests are full, take their two action cards, complete their actions, and on and on and on you go. So let's look in a little more detail at the action cards and what they all mean, since that's the real meat of the game, um, besides obviously buying our guests. Okay, so there are 11 different types of action cards. I'm going to go through each of them. So there is a asset card, so you can pick up two wealth asset cards and have them to your hand. And there are corresponding ones for each type of asset. Um, you've got wild asset card, add one asset of your choice from the asset bank to your hand. Pretty self-explanatory. Add a guess. So for this one, you roll the dice. Let's say we roll a 11. 
if the number correlates to an empty seat at your table, and we don't have anything at 11 or 12, add the top guess from the guest pile to that seat. So this would be this one, not any of the ones that are face up. We would just take Mr. William Elliot, and then we can place him at our table. Uh, remove a guest. You pick the player, and then they must remove one guest of their choice from their table. Still an asset. You can steal a random asset card, so they would just hold out their hand from an opposing player of your choice. And limit. So if you play this card as your action, all players must reduce their asset card hand to five cards. All discarded cards must be returned to the bank. So if you recall, you can do things in any order that you want. So you could choose this as your action, but spend many of your own asset cards and then make everyone else reduce theirs. So there is, so, but the active player, so the person playing the card, must reduce their car, their hand down to five as well. So you probably only want to play that if it's going to work out well to you. Indisposed. So this is where our little indisposed tokens come in. And you can move an indisposed token onto any guest at any table. So you could put them on yourself, though most likely you won't want to. Exception we'll get at to at the end, but most often not, because if you're indisposed, then when her number five is rolled, we will get no reward. So, not really... Uh, but, so you can move a uh, indisposed token. You can either move one, uh, put a new one out, or if you have one on yourself, you can move one of those tokens to someone else as well. So that's why it says move an indisposed token. Table improvement. So this you would just basically place by your table um, and pick up one beauty asset card when the a seven is rolled. So you remember how I said if you roll a seven, then you may pick up some assets. That's what these table improvements are. And then there's a second type of table improvement, and that is that instead of trading four of one asset for any one type, you can trade three of one asset for any one type. So a nice table improvement. Rearrange guests, so rearrange any number of guests at your table. We went through that. Steal an improvement. So if you saw somebody with the beauty asset card table improvement, you could steal that from them and then put that at your table. And we went through add a guest, didn't we? So that is how you play the basic game. It's lots of fun. It's got lots of fun quotes. There are different quotes on every single card that we have here. So that's great. If you love Jane Austen, there are lots of great quotes that you can continually read as you're going throughout your game. Each asset card also has a different quote. If you play and really master the basic game and want to add a bit more intrigue, that is where they have added the missions. Now, the missions are designed so that they can be played by people who know Jane Austen really well or by people who don't know Jane Austen at all. So, you have the social butterfly. That's your non Janeites or Austenites, and then you have your Janeite missions. 
So with this, it just has an additional criteria that you would need to meet in order to win the game. So for social butterfly, we'd have, this is one example, guests with a combined total of at least 18 in wealth asset cost, and at most 5 wit asset cost. So that could be rather challenging. And then for the Jainite, only title gentry, gentry, heirs to a title, are those with three wealth in their asset cost. So the serves or people who are going to inherit a sir or a lady, or those who are quite wealthy, so I would assume a mister. So for these, you actually keep them secret until you're going to claim your win. So if you're going to do missions, each person will select a mission uh, secretly and it will be agreed upon if you're doing genites or social butterflies at the beginning. Um, because obviously it wouldn't be fair for the genites uh, if they're playing with social butterflies wouldn't be able to tell them if they've done it or not. But, so then you would select that, and you'll keep it secret, and then reveal it when you're going to claim your win, that you've filled your table and completed your mission. So, that is how you use the missions. I hope that's explained how you go through the rules, and I hope you'll join me next time when we finally get into playing a game of polite society.